Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, dear colleagues, a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, uh, depending on where you are joining from. My name is Dominique Burgeon, and I am the director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva. It is my pleasure to welcome you uh, today to the fifth session of the FAO in Geneva Social Protection Dialogue Series, organized in close cooperation with the FAO Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equality uh, Division in Rome. The thematic dialogue series on social protection aims to raise awareness on the role of social protection as a key instrument for poverty reduction and inclusive growth in rural areas and in turn as a key instrument for achieving the objectives and targets of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Through the engagement of distinguished speakers, the Social Protection Dialogue Series showcases concrete examples of achievements made by countries in strengthening and extending social protection systems as a core ingredient of strategies seeking to promote more resilient, inclusive, efficient, and sustainable agri-food systems. The dialogue series is primarily intended to foster discussion between participants and feed and inform Geneva-based policy-making processes. Today, our session will seek to advance understanding of the concept and the pragmatic implications of gender transformative social protection for rural women. This dialogue is particularly timely as the voluntary guidelines on gender equality and women's and girls' empowerment in the context of the food security and nutrition was recently endorsed by the Committee on World Food Security at its 51st session in October in Rome. It is also opportune as FAO, together with IFA and WFP, has been implementing the joint program on gender transformative approaches, or GTAs, for food security and nutrition to help embed GTAs within the work of these three agencies. Furthermore, the Interagency Standing Committee Policy on Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women and Girls in Humanitarian Action, endorsed in 2017, is currently under revision. So before we start a few housekeeping uh, measures, let me remind you of some housekeeping rules indeed for uh, today's session. The session will last for about 90 minutes and it will be recorded. Please keep your microphones muted, and we encourage you to post your comments and questions in the Q&A module throughout the session. At the end of the presentation, we will try to accommodate as many questions as the time permits and give you the opportunity. Now, I would like to give the floor to our moderator today, Lauren Phillips, the Deputy Director of the uh, Division in Rome. Lauren, over to you. Thanks so much, Dominique, for the introduction. And thank you always for your collaboration and hosting this excellent session of, of seminars. And um, good morning and good afternoon, all of you who are joining us. And thank you for being here. Um, as Dominique mentioned, my name is Lauren Phillips, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division at FAO headquarters. And I'm happy to be moderating today. So uh, before we begin, and before I introduce you to the excellent speakers we have here today, I'd like to tell you a little bit more, adding on to what Dominique has said about the topic for today's session. So this year, FAO published a major new report called The Status of Women in Agri-Food Systems, um, which highlights the fact that more than, 30, more than 36 percent of women in the world depend on agri-food systems for their jobs. Um, and in regions like Sub-Saharan Africa or Southern Asia, those statistics increase much more. So more than 66% of women in Sub-Saharan Africa work in agri-food systems, and more than 70% of women in South Asia, for example, work in agri-food systems. 
Uh, despite the fact that so many women rely on agri-food systems for their livelihoods, women experience structural discrimination and disadvantages, as well as continuing to have gaps in their access to important assets and resources, services, and decent rural employment opportunities in agri-food systems. Um, this is also in a context of a period of increasing number of shocks where global hunger has been on the rise, um, despite previous decades of progress on reducing poverty and hunger. And COVID-19 had a very dramatic and negative impact on women's employment opportunities in agri-food systems, but also on um, hunger and malnutrition. Uh, in fact, the gap between women and men's um, food insecurity rose uh, during COVID-19 um, to more than four percentage points. Um, so we, we know that um, there's a, a serious problem of confronting hunger in the world with more than 600 million people estimated to still be in hunger by 2030. But we also know that there's a serious gender gap, which we have to address in both access to livelihoods and, and um, in making sure people have sustainable livelihoods and in reducing hunger um, and malnutrition. Um, and in fact, this report that I just mentioned also highlights the fact that social protection can be a very important tool for enhancing women's resilience to all sorts of shocks, whether they come from climatic shocks or shocks like COVID-19. Um, and so therefore, I think it's very important to think about how social protection programs um, can reduce gender inequality. Having said all of that, there is often a tendency for social uh, protection programs to not adequately take into consideration the types of barriers and constraints that women face um, on using social protection, whether those are about um, the qualifications people need or if it's about social norms um, and discriminatory practices. For example, uh, an assessment recently by UN Women and UNICEF found that gender considerations were inadequately integrated into social protection policies in 74 low and lower middle income countries. And an additional study by UN Women and UNDP found that only a minority of COVID-19 social protection responses were gender sensitive, right? So we know that in order to realize the potential of social protection, helping women and their families cope with shocks um, and also to just enhance their well-being generally, we really need to go beyond addressing the symptoms of gender equality and try to tackle these structural discriminatory practices against women, which include unequal power relations and social norms. And, you know, I think it's really important not to put the burden on women per se, but also to work with men and boys to help promote positive changes to norms, um, which will allow us to have a sort of a more inclusive um, agri-food system and agri-food system transformation, um, and therefore help us achieve our, our goals jointly um, towards the SDGs. Um, I think as um, Dominique was hinting at, FAO in collaboration with the GTA um, program has come up with a, a recent conceptual framework on gender transformative social protection, which provides both evidence on impacts and practical examples of, of good programs. Um, and to build on this work, we're hoping to use this conversation to advance uh, to see how we can learn more from excellent country examples. So that's the sort of the start. Now let me just um, talk about how we're gonna organize the session and introduce our excellent panel of speakers. Um, so first, we're going to have three keynote speakers, um, and I'm going to introduce them and their titles in turn. So we have Ms. Patricia Moyawama, who's the Director of Community Development of the Ministry of Community Development and Social Services of the, in Zambia. And she's going to kick off the session by presenting the social protection program in Zambia and how it's contributing to gender equality. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you for being here. Uh, then we'll hear from Ms. Elgin Madzo, who's the Gender and Development Unit Head for the Four Ps Program in the Department of Social Welfare and Development in the Philippines. And she will introduce the gender transformative aspects of the Philippines Four Ps Program. Welcome, Elgin. And finally, we'll have Professor Valentina Bodrug, who will take the floor to present the Moldovan Country Gender Assessment and its Social Protection Chapter. She is the Social and Gender Expert and an Associate Professor at Moldova State University. Um, and so what we hope is that these presentations will give us an overview of how social protection can be gender transformative and make a meaningful contribution to empowering rural women in these three very different contexts. Uh, and then we'll have some reactions from our panelists. So let me introduce them as well. So Professor Lucy Col uh, Kluver from um, Professor of Child and Family Social Work at the Department of Social Policy and Intervention, University of Oxford. Welcome, Lucy. And Pontus Corgensen, Special Social Protection Officer at FAO. Welcome, Pontus, as well. Um, and they will share their initial reactions to the presentations we'll hear and then set the scene for the discussion. So thank you to all five of us, five of you for being here. 
And finally, we'll have some Q&A. So I look forward to your interesting questions. Um, I'm going to pass the floor to Patricia so she can share Zambia's experience. So Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Unfortunately, Patricia, we can't hear you. I'm not sure if you're muted, but you don't look like you are. Let's see. I was muted, sorry. There you go, now we can hear you, thank you. Right, so thank you very much for having um, me on uh, the panel. And thank you very much for inviting Zambia as a whole to just come and explain um, our experience and what we're doing uh, for social protection, especially in my department, um, uh, community development. Um, the community development um, um, department is part of the Ministry of um, Community Development and Social Services. So we have um, three or two other um, social protection uh, departments. Mine, um, you know, has um, a number of um, you know, a number of units um, that we uh, do under the social protection. The mandate of the ministry, first of all, um, is um, that we handle the key social protection programs um, which feature uh, to empower rural women and also enhance women's participation on the food security pack. The food security pack is a flagship. It's um, um, one that really uh, makes sure that um, we empower the women. Um, and 63% um, of the people or family households that are on the food security pack are women. And so we also have uh, deliberately, you know, gotten um, the criteria to take care of the women headed households. Um, we also, you know, have, you know, the children headed households uh, in the criteria, which at the end of the day, you know, gives us, um, you know, a lot of women empowered. We can go to the next uh, slide. Um, I will go to explain exactly what the mandate is and, uh, you know, um, the Gazette notices. Uh, the mandate of the ministry is very important. Actually, I have coined uh, this mandate um, as the, um, um, the, the, nerve, the nerve center of the country because we interface with, uh, you know, all the communities, um, you know, be they rural or you know urban but mostly we find that the, the the rural women are the ones that we target mostly so that um, you know we get them out of the vulnerability um and this um you know government uh, um was government gazette notice was uh, done in 2016 uh it it, it implements uh, basic social protection programs aimed at protecting promoting and assisting the poor and vulnerable households um, in society the households um in zambia are usually five to six um you know people so um the the food security pack uh, which will be um elaborated upon um, takes care of uh, the women throughout the year. We have um, in the FSB three components, um, you know, that um, we run where government has provided funding for us to issue fertilizer um, and um, ruminants, little animals um, and poultry uh, for nutrition. Uh, the services provided are aimed at enhancing the, this development and accelerating national development. The next slide, please. So like I alluded to earlier, um, the ministry um, has three main departments which uh, deal with the social protection um, uh, programs and uh, mine is uh, community development. Uh, there's also social welfare. As you can see, uh, 
community development, uh, which I handle throughout the country, um, I have, you know, mechanisms and structures from the province and we have 10 provinces in Zambia. So you can just imagine we have 10 provinces in Zambia and 116 districts. And in each and every one of those districts, I have an officer with officers below them. And not only that, we also go to the ward level, which is um, uh, supposed to have 1.8, not uh, 1,858 wards. And in each one of those, we have an officer manning that. And then from there, these are government of officers. From there, we have uh, you know volunteers as well at the bottom. So we have uh, vast structures to take care of um, you know our people. Um, so we also have community development training. Um, there are people who would have fallen out of education systems because they couldn't make it or they didn't have uh, you know funds to take them through. So we have um, skill centers dotted around the country. We have 16 of them and then we have two colleges which collaborate with uh, universities um, um, in the country to offer degree um, lessons. Um, I think, the slide has gone next, yes. So I was talking about community development and then we have uh, the food program management, the food security pack that I was talking about. And with this one, I must say that we are collaborating very well with the FAO. Uh, the food security pack uh, you know, program has been um, taken on by FAO. And currently as I speak, my officers are all out in the um, you know four regions of the country, training um, um, trainers of trainers because we are digitizing um, the two hundred and two hundred and forty one thousand um, um, beneficiary households that are going to be having. Um, this uh, program uh, digitized. Mainly, uh, the reason why we want to have that is uh, for efficiency, uh, accountability on when we issue the inputs, and then also transparency. It has been very difficult in the past, you know, for us from head office to track how the fertilizer is being issued out. Um, so when FAO came on board to help us digitize, it has been a very welcome move and um, we have moved, um, you know, very well so far. I'm very excited. Um, you know, just yesterday I was traveling from Southern Province where I met, um, you know, my officers who are training others to come and, um, you know, use uh, the pilot, you know, for this digitization. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, group housing, which we call the self-help, uh, where the communities, um, you know, come together, put um, resources together, 25% of it. And then after government has assessed um, their BOQs, they take on 75% and uh, they will help them with funding to build um, whatever recreation halls or, you know, housing or business, um, you know, entities that they want to build. And then we also have uh, supporting um, um, self-help. And then we also have uh, SWL. SWL is uh, the Supporting Women's Livelihood, which is funded by uh, the World Bank. All that is done by my officers with all those structures that I was mentioning that are you know, throughout the country. Um, but what's, um, um, what, what's really um, intriguing and very, um, uh, help is that uh, FAO do not stop just in my department. Social welfare um, are a different, um, you know, uh, program and unit um, in the ministry, and FAO does play a role in there as well. Um, FAO is also obviously working with uh, the, the child development. These uh, departments have their own directors, and I think that they would be speaking better to this. Can I have the next next um, slide, please? Thank you. Um, 
The key social protection uh, program features uh, to empower rural women, affirmative action to empower more women using the selection criteria, such as the female headed households, I mentioned that. Um, this is made deliberate, um, you know, so that we can have an encouragement of more women uh, in the programs that, um, you know, we, we, we run. Um, we have recently noticed that, um, you know, when women are in the fore of these, um, you know, programs, we are able to tackle a lot of other things, um, you know, including nutrition, which um, has been seen in most of our rural areas where we have stunted children because, you know, you know, uh, sometimes programs would be given to um, the other gender who obviously, you know, don't look at uh, nutrition as, uh, you know, the, the woman, the women would. Um, there's also, um, uh, you know, households that are keeping orphans. Um, we, we also make sure that those ones are in the fore. Um, we also have um, um, a provision of uh, social protection, which supports um, um, the de facto, um, you know, uh, breadwinner. Um, and then we also have, we also roll out uh, savings support. So these households that we give um, input to, um, once they have done their farming and they probably have some extra uh, monies to sell um, their produce, we have gone out to go and teach them on how to do savings so that they multiply their money. And it's working very well because, you know, that extra money goes a long way in them either expanding their storehouses for more food or even educating their children and sending their children to school. Um, next slide, please. And Patricia, because we're running a little bit behind, I hate to interrupt you because it's so interesting, but just to ask you if you can find a way to keep the information condensed, please. Thank you so much. Right, thank you. Um, the key social protection program features uh, to empower rural women. Um, this is um, implementation of the Cash Plus agenda, which encourages provision uh, of uh, multiple social protection support uh, to households to ensure quick graduation. We do graduate them off the programs, but even as we graduate them, we have all, we've got a mechanism where um, we ask them to do some paybacks 10% of what we give them so that they can buy or do projects that will help them so that they are self-sustainable. Um, we also have uh, capacity building for households to enhance their livelihood skills. Um, we also involve, there's also involvement of the community structures called community welfare um, assistance to help us um, you know, identify and continue to monitor and evaluate their progress in whatever social protection um, um, uh, field we have, uh, you know, put them in. And then to the next slide, the last one, the key challenges in mainstreaming gender in social protection, um, Inadequacy support uh, under the various social protection programs uh, to enhance beneficiary welfare and timely um, graduation. There's inadequate volumes of interventions to reach all eligible households that need the support. And there's lack of um, insurance. Uh, we have insured, um, you know, half of our beneficiaries in the rain fed. Uh, but it would have been good to, uh, to, to, to have insurance for everyone so that uh, with the climate change, um, one can you know, hope to you know, give those that are going through problems um, such as those. And then there's also inadequacy um, of capacity building, livelihood skills, uh, transfer due to inadequate extension staff. Um, as um, I have the whole country um, you know, under, uh, under me, and there's certain uh, places where we don't have staff because of um, either lack of funding or um, no housing in the in the areas where 
you know, people are supposed to reach out for the poor and vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. I liked your description of, uh, of your work as the nerve center of the country. And um, I appreciate your honest assessment of some of the challenges that Zambia is facing and making sure that as many women and families are reached as possible. So thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm you. going to turn it over now to our next speaker. Um, so Ms. Elgin Madzo, uh, who's going to present the Four Peace program from Philippines. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. We can't hear you, maybe you're muted. Please go ahead, I think we can hear you now, let's see. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good evening from the Philippines. Good morning or good afternoon, your countries. Thank you very much for inviting the Philippines to present this uh, gender mainstreaming in the, our program, particularly in the Pantawid Pamilyan Philippine Program of the Department of Social Welfare and Development. And we're glad that we'll be, uh, we are part of this Social Protection Dialogue Series entitled Gender Transformative Social Protection. Uh, the four piece ba uh, basic program design. Okay. The Pantry Filipino program in the Philippines is a conditional cash transfer program that targets the poor sectors all the populations that started in year 2008. The Pantawid Pamilyan Filipino Program, or 4Ps, aims to provide financial support to vulnerable populations for a maximum of seven years, which in turn facilitates access to social services, improves employment opportunities, raises living standards, and enhances overall quality of life for all program beneficiaries and their communities. And the next slides, uh, based on the targeting women's vulnerability and the needs of these uh, programs, eligibility criteria, uh, as per section six of the Republic Act 11310 or the Pantawid Familia Filipino Program, uh, as we have shown in the slides that farmers, fisher folks, homeless families, indigenous or peoples, those in the formal sectors or others, in essence, that the Pantawid Pamilya Filipino program recognizes the diverse needs and vulnerabilities of these eligible beneficiaries and provides target assistance to address their specific challenges. This is to improve the level of well-being of these individuals families and reduce poverty and promote human capital development in the Philippines. Now in the next slides, uh, provided that the, these eligible beneficiaries, they have to be followed with the conditional, conditionalities of the program. Now we have the following criteria. Uh, A, uh, classify as poor or near poor, based on the standardized targeting system and the poverty threshold established by the Philippine Statistics Authority at the time of selections. So meaning, poor families refer to those living below the poverty threshold. These are households facing economic hardships and struggling to meet their basic needs. Conditions and compliance to the program are Parents or guardians, caregivers must attend the family development session. Two, children zero to five years old must receive regular preventive health checkups and vaccines. Three, children aged six to 14 must receive the warming pills twice a year. And four, pregnant women must visit their local health facility to avail prenatal checkups and other health services and five 
Children age 3 to 4 must attend daycare classes, while children age 5 to 18 must enroll in elementary and secondary school classes. So as you shown in the next slides, if you want to know the details, this, that are the conditional conditions for entitlement. So meaning under in the pregnant women, no, uh, stated available prenatal services, give birth in a health facility, receive postpartum and postnatal care, uh, zero to five years old, receive regular health and nutrition services, undergo checkups and vaccinations, one to 14 years old, avail of the warming pills twice a year, as I mentioned a while ago. So meaning in that conditions are specified in the four case law. Next slide. Now, as to the mainstreaming gender and development in the conditionalist by making women's needs visible in the programs, we have set uh, several conditions. And one, conditional cash transfers for maternity and child health. Conditional cash transfers for maternal, maternal and child health directly addresses the specific healthcare needs of women during pregnancy, child birth, and child rearing, ensuring that women have access to essential healthcare services. Like for example, as I mentioned a while ago, pre and postnatal checkups of pregnant women, vaccination of zero to five years of preventive health and nutrition, one to 14 years avail of the warming pills on others. The Pantawid Filipino uh, or four piece, the Pantawid Pamilyan Filipino program or four piece had a positive impact on the education of women and girls in the Philippines, aligning with several sustainable development goals related to poverty reduction, education, gender equality, and reducing inequalities. It plays a significant role in improving the lives of women and girls in impoverished communities ultimately contributing to the country's social and economic development. The cash grants provided by 4 can be used for educational expenses such as school supplies, uniforms, and transportation costs. The financial support makes it easier for girls to access quality education and stay enrolled. And the next slide, another in and gender and development, we have women's empowerment through family development sessions. So family development sessions are strategies to capacitate mothers and fathers to become more responsive to the family's need, particularly on health and education. And financial literacy includes knowing how to create an appropriate decision in budgeting and spending, plan for savings, and track personal spending, as well as the use of transaction accounts as the mode of payments. And the next slide uh, is include also that the family de development sessions includes uh, Gulayans Barangay or other known as community backyard gardening. This refers to the backyard versus garden contribute to women empowerment because it is a shared responsibilities. It challenges traditional roles of women and women, where women are typically for the household while men are for any income. It also encourages participants to reflect on, if required challenge, these roles and empowers women to make informed decisions about their food security. By participating in backyard gardening, women cannot only grow their own vegetables, but also potentially generate income by selling surplus, surplus produce and expand beyond their traditional household chores, demonstrating that they are capable of contributing to the family's food security and income. Further, engaging community gardening can contribute to better health outcomes and overall well-being, reinforcing the idea that women play a vital role in the family's nutrition and health. And another mainstream in gender and development in the conditionality is by making women's needs visible in the program, we have also issuance of policies and guidance tools. In sustaining the gender responsiveness of these strategies and activities for the beneficiaries, particularly on women and children, issuance of policies and guidance are crucial for gender mainstreaming efforts and activities because they provide a structured and comprehensive approach to achieving gender equality. 
deserve as a foundation for legal compliance accountability, resource allocation, guidance, and cultural change. The Philippine government's embed gender considerations into policies to ensure that it is in integral part of the program operations and having a minimum progress toward gender equality. As the Department of Social Welfare and the Development leads in social protection, social case management is important in four piece because it ensures that assistance is targeted and in addressing the specific needs of the beneficiaries. It empowers individuals and families, prevent issues from the ground, facilitates coordination and referrals, and provides ongoing monitoring and evaluation. It plays a vital role in delivering appropriate <coughs> support to those in need and promoting their long-term well-being and self-sufficiency. I can just uh, give you a warning. We're a bit over time, so if you can please finish when you when you can. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think we have to show to you the some of the accomplishment. No, as the I think it's the last page. No, of the slides. As of uh, June 30, 2023, so for the conditionalities as to the prenatal and postnatal care, we have 55.75% no, out of 9,788, nine uh, 5, 5,457% as 55%. It's also in the children 0 to 5 years old, it's 97.76%. Attendance to family development sessions, or FDS is 95.0%, and the children 6 to 18 years old in the household assigned, assigned as a deep ed or Department of Education Learner Reference Number, it's 72.51%. The beneficiaries exceed from the program, there are a total of 226,998 households exited from the program, and to the backyard gardening or vegetable gardening, with in coordination with the different stakeholders, it's 89.90%. Those mostly who are women participated in these activities. And I think we have to provide the challenges on the ways forward. So as to the challenges, uh, uh, we have we prepared only one key challenge, and the challenge is level of well-being of the program beneficiaries affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and other calamities. Why? The COVID-19 pandemic significantly disrupted the well-being of forest beneficiaries in the Philippines, forcing many to shift from their initial level three, which is sufficiency, to level two, uh, which is subsistence. And in some cases, even down to level one or survival. This downward transition resulted from a combination of economic hardships, healthcare concerns, education, disruptions, rising living expenses, and the psychological toll of the pandemic and other calamities. These challenges collectively created a more demanding environment for low-income families, hindering their ability to attain and will be improvement additionally aimed for by the program. Shall we proceed to the ways forward? So the, the ways forward for the for this program, the first recommendation focused on the proactive step of enhancing gender sensitivity programs to empower rural women and promote gender equality. The second recommendation highlights the importance of maintaining and improving monitoring efforts to understand and address the specific needs of rural women through data driven and policy changes. And that's all the program, uh, Pantawid Pamilya Filipino program of the Department of Social Welfare and Development in the Philippines and National Anti Poverty Production, uh, Poverty Alleviation Program. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving us such a comprehensive overview of a very uh, well integrated and uh, dynamic sounding program. And we appreciate your. Your presentation. I'm going to uh, pass us to the next um, speaker. So, Professor Bodrak, um, you're going to talk a little bit about Moldova's experience and the floor is yours. I should have said to the other speakers, we're supposed to use seven minutes each. So that's why I keep interrupting everybody. So just so you're aware, thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Greetings from Moldova. And uh, it's honor and ple pleasure for me to present our uh, uh, interesting experience and to participate to contribute to our discussions. 
Uh, Republic of Moldova, it's small country, but beautiful, and uh, but with a lot of problem and uh, achievement, as in many countries. Um, first of all, I would like to mention that uh, um, now in the Republic of Moldova, you have uh, 2 million, 600,000 population, 42% um, uh, are women, 47% uh, are from rural area, and uh, we should understand that it's very important to ensure a balanced approach. And also our today's sub subject about gender transformative approach. Of course, the Republic of Moldova has many countries in the region and many, many countries at the global level have good practices, put a lot of efforts to ensure uh, all human rights for different vulnerable groups, for all population. Uh, between achievement, I would like to specify specifically that uh, Republic of Moldova is part of CEDAW Convention or the Istanbul Convention. We have a strong legal framework on gender equality and women's empowerment, including on prevention and combating violence against women. Based on the gender quota, the number of women in decision-making position increased the last years. Social and economic policy have contributed to an overall decline of the poverty rate, but area of residence is a strong determinant of household poverty. Between challenge, we can mention COVID impact. Now we have a multiple crisis, also relating to war in Ukraine, also, we should specify migration factor, aging factor of population. And despite of the progress and the adoption of the good legal framework, several challenges remain regarding its implementation. At the moment, we have it's a lack of national mechanism for gender equality. Also, we should mention gaps in the continuity of the social assistance policy. But Specifically, I would like to mention uh, our uh, um, Moldova country gender assessment, which follows support. Our country gender assessment focuses on intersections of gender, agriculture, and rural development, and present a critical gender-based inequality and their consequence for agriculture production and rural life. In general, women depend on a greater degree on social benefits, and men are more involved in income generating, generating activity. Also, as in many countries, women's engagement in domestic and care work is one of the limiting factors, the ability to take a formal employee and to have a more choice for their life. But it's very important to mention that our report include valuable recommendation on enhancing agriculture in developing rural community, which is gender sensitive perspective. And I would like to mention that some inputs of our report were included in the national strategy for agriculture and rural development for the next years. And as transversal aspects of the strategy are climate resilience, gender equality, and women's economic empowerment. As cross-cutting as mentioned, stimulation of the development of family farms and business in rural area by young people, women, and migrant population. Of course, we can discuss more issues, but specifically, one of the recommendations, one of the issues uh, discussed in the frame of our uh, uh, validation process of our uh, country report was discussion on paternity leave. And today I would like to mention these issues as one of the best practices on transformative approach, gender transformative approach. Paternity leave. Oh. Paternity leave was introduced to encourage men's involvement in childcare. Starting with the second half of 
2016, paternity leave is granted for 40 days. Paternity leave increase women's life satisfaction, allows father to lay the groundwork for a more equal distribution of family responsibility. And it's a good tool and very important step to deconstruct gender stereotypes. Paternity leave can positively influence parents' decision on how to allocate resources for child care, housework, and future employment of women, but also could inspire other, specifically other men, to make similar choices. Specifically, I would like to mention a set of recommendations of uh, in the frame of our uh, country gender assessment addressed to governance, to international partners, to civil society organization. And one of the best practices in the frame of our exercise was involvement and cooperation between government and civil society organization and international development partners. And I would like to mention uh, our experience, involvement of Platform for Gender Equality on several uh, women's associations who contribute a lot to have a very clear picture and to address uh, the most important issues in this uh, uh, quadri gender assessment. But one other moment in very interesting practices was based on our recommendation, Increase digital literacy and access to, to technology for vulnerable people in the rural area, including women, specifically older women. Now, thanks to our partner for development and uh, other uh, stakeholders and civil society organization, several programs were extended on digital literacy programs were implemented in rural area, specifically in school, but also addressed to elderly people, most of whom are women. I think we can discuss more issues, but it's very important to collect these best practices, to rethinking our attitude on gender profile of rural population, Today, we should use intersectionality, intersectional approach, and to connect very clear gender, age, disability, rural, urban, and other criteria. We have a huge responsibility, but it's very important to think on this, empowered girls and women. It's strong and resilient society. It's powerful society. And all of us, we have a huge responsibility for this, for our population, for our women and girls, for our men and boys. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Valentina, for this very impassioned message and um, for mentioning, I think, in the end as well, the importance of having an intersectional approach when we talk about these issues. So I really appreciate your intervention. Um, so I would like to now pass the floor to our panelists who are going to do some reflections and invite, uh, I invite them to give some feedback on the presentations we've heard in taking around four or five minutes. So Lucy, first I'm going to pass to you. So building on your experience in leading the Accelerate Hub, um, what sorts of innovation have you seen in social protection that can generate gender transformative impacts and what, how does that relate to what you've heard here today? Over to you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for three inspiring presentations. Um, I'm just going to reflect on three things. The first is that what Patricia um, in Zambia, what Elgin in the Philippines, and what Valentina in Moldova have just spoken to you about is substantially backed by the evidence base. And I'm just going to give you an example, which you can see behind me. This is a study done with the government of South Africa looking at a group who are really perhaps some of the most vulnerable um, young women and adolescent girls in rural contexts. This is adolescent mothers 
in a rural province of South Africa. And they looked at a whole set of different um, interventions. This is a study of a thousand adolescent girls who are mothers and their children and found four things that predicted multiple positive impacts in their lives. What they found was that the combination of food security, which was predicted by social protection, having safe parenting, a non-abusive parenting environment, having a clinic where you were not shouted at when you went to get support, and having some kind of access to childcare resulted in an extraordinary range of positive outcomes. And, and many of these, these are exactly what you've just been hearing about, the combinations of parenting support and food security that, that we saw in the Philippines, the combinations of support for, for um, women to, to achieve employment. Um, but what we see is that combination results in substantial outcomes for um, for economic outcomes like school enrollment, work engagement. We see gender-based outcomes like gender-based violence, sexual violence prevention. We see mental health outcomes. Um, we see HIV risk reduction outcomes, and we see improvements in contraception uptake and use. And so what we're seeing from a, a massive um, study, longitudinal study, is exactly mirroring the strength and the value of what is being achieved in these three countries. The second thing that um, the evidence suggests, and, and again, really seen by these three countries, is that where it is, where it is most effective to become gender sensitive, it is not just about cash, it is about cash plus care in smart and clever combinations. We've seen from, particularly from, um, Zambia and from the Philippines, that, that this is achievable at scale. It doesn't have to be boutique programs, it can be rolled out through national government systems. We also see new opportunities for scale, and I was struck by it when Valentina mentioned the opportunities for digital literacy and training amongst um, rural women, and the opportunities to reach women, to use that to reach women with cash plus care services. But I was also struck that these are wonderful exemplars. But as Lauren said from the report, which has recently been released, they are not yet the norm. And so the next great challenge for us is how do we make these gender sensitive social protection programs the absolute norm? In five years time, we have discussions and they are everywhere in the world. The last thing that I want to add is this that we are going to have to start looking at social protection and gender sensitive social protection in a new paradigm of global threats. This came out in all of the presentations. Patricia mentioned climate threats. Valentina mentioned climate resilience. Elgin mentioned developing family support in COVID. And as we see increased rates of climate hazards, increased rates and potentially new epidemics and pandemics, and the risk that that will be associated with increased levels of political instability. We need to be designing those social protection programs with that flexibility and adaptation in mind. There was an extraordinary example um, in the Philippines um, when, um, when the, the department which you, you discussed, working together with Ateneo de Millennium University, adapted the Cash Plus Care program with parenting support and social protection to reach millions of families in a global pandemic and during lockdown. And I think if, if I had one thing for us to take away is that we are going to have to think about scale and we also are gonna to have to get smart about anticipatory planning for a, a new set of challenges. Thank you. And over um, to our next wonderful speaker who I know well, and I'm looking forward to hearing Pontus. Thank you so much, Lucy. Actually, it'd be great if you wouldn't mind, or if my colleagues wouldn't mind putting the link to the study that you have the slide on there in the chat so people could see it. I think those, those results are very impressive. And I, um, I take to heart what you said about finding out how to do this at scale, how to make it the norm and how to make it anticipatory so that we can avoid the shocks and crises you mentioned. I also wanted to highlight childcare, um, which is also one of the recommendations of the of the gender report that we wrote. And it's something that's often overlooked in um, 
in agri-food system policies. Um, people don't tend to think about it, but it's obviously critical. And I think you've also heard that from Valentina's presentation, thinking about paternity leave, for example, is an important component of making sure that um, care is part of the cash plus care co um, combination. So thank you. Okay, um, and now I'm gonna pass over to Pontus, my colleague, um, to give us also four to five minutes of reflection. And I wanted to start by sort of asking you you know, as a as a young person, um, how do you think that we can combine gender transformative programming and social protection and make sure that it works for young people as well? I think Lucy started talking about this, but that and any other reflections you have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And also, thank you very much for having a such a strong um, youth perspective in this discussion. You know, it's absolutely essential if we are to um, to achieve the gender transformative approach. And I will try to provide some reflections through commenting on, on, on what I heard today. And I would like to start by just a few reflections on the presentation from Zambia and Philippines. Thank you so much. It is clearly a lot we can and, and should be learning from, from your respective programs. And like uh, Lucy also elaborated on, um, Laura as well, I think that the Cash Plus agenda really stands out as well as coordinating different types of support. So for example, in, in, um, in Zambia, coordinating the social cash transfer with other type of livelihood input support through the, 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 the food security pack. And in, in, in the Philippines, linking um, the, 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 the cash transfer with the family development sessions, for example. And I, I, it was very interesting that you brought up the impact that you have had in the Philippines on education specifically. I know in Zambia as well, you have a very interesting program called the Keeping Girls in School as well. And there, yes, we see a very strong impact on enrollment, which is, of course, is very po positive in itself. But then we also see all these very important indirect effects that are very so, so protective for young people and specifically young girls, such as um, you know, protecting against gender-based violence, child marriage, and these indirect effects we shouldn't underestimate. And um, the gender transformative approach really helps us to understand these pathways better. Um, I also want to comment on the presentation from, uh, from Moldova and Laura, uh, Laura and you were also mentioning there about the, the paternity leave. It was so interesting to hear to hear, to hear this reflection, how it's been introduced to try to in increase the father's involvement in childcare. And paternity leave, it's so important, but also very neglected in social protection. And uh, uh, to some extent, maternity leave, it, uh, it does exist in Polish level in a lot of countries, but uh, paternity leave is nearly completely absent, and especially in the Africa region where I work. And that is concerning, and especially against the, some of the new evidence that's coming out that's, that is showing that when we have strong maternity leave, but very weak paternity leave, it can even uh, increase the, the gender gap, which is obviously the opposite of what we want to achieve with these policies. So we really need to focus on and think about how we can better involve fathers and um, men and boys more generally in our programming. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for all the presentations and I'll end there and take uh, look forward to some questions. Thank you so much, Pontus. That's um, some very interesting reflections, especially the points you were mentioning on the data about paternity and maternity leave. So I really appreciate that. Well, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A already. So I want to encourage uh, others to put their questions in and maybe I can sort of kick off with some questions for our panelists and I'll try to combine that with the, at least one of the questions in the Q&A. Um, I think I'm going to turn to Patricia first, Patricia. Um, you know, I think you have a question here in the chat as well, but can you try to summarize for us, um, you know, what what you think uh, are the sort of policy features or the features of programming that are needed to empower rural women in social protection programs? I think that this is akin to the question that's in the chat about, you know, what is the role of policies ensuring gender transformative impacts? So Patricia, let me give you two minutes to respond to that first, over to you. Patricia, are you there? Maybe she can't come in. Okay, Valentina, I see you have your hand up. Why don't you come in first and then we'll see if Patricia comes back in. Yes, but uh, Lauren, uh, I would like to mention uh, the question relating the police involvement because it's exactly connected to which my uh, subject today. Uh, in Moldova, we have a multidisciplinary team who work on uh, uh, domestic violence issues. Uh, one of the 
important key person is police officer. Police officers uh, work at local level, work on prevention, but also on combating. And it's very important involvement of police uh, officers in education program on prevention, how to work with boys, how to deconstruct toxic masculinity, how to increase transformative masculinity, how to deconstruct gender stereotype, how to involve boys to be more gender sensitive, to avoid bullying, to avoid aggressive behavior, and to take gender sensitive, gender transformative decision. It's very important. But also they are model to be strong police officer, but doesn't mean to be aggressive. I think we can explore these issues. We have a more examples, but it's very important to select the most relevant and to promote, to explore. Because it's very important to uh, uh, discuss not only about girls and, 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 and women. They are center, they are key person, but it's very important to involve in our work, boys and men. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, um, especially about getting sort of the, the norms to change and making sure people can engage in a positive fashion. Thank you so much. I think Elgin wants to come in on this question too. And I also will take the opportunity to sort of ask her the que a question that came up in the chat from one of our participants, the permanent mission of Brazil to the UN in Geneva, which is um, about the challenge of reaching and enrolling rural women in social protection programs in remote areas. Um, so Elgin, if you want to comment on the challenge of, you know, getting remote women involved, as well as um, um, answering whatever, whatever you're interested in. So please go ahead over to you. Yeah, in the Philippines, I think uh, the, the women who are in remote areas, they are encouraged to participate actively in whatever services or activities that they want to participate in. In the Philippines, we have a lot of national laws encouraging uh, women, uh, regardless of their status, to participate in the development processes, as well as including uh, men, uh, accountable practice in eliminating those uh, uh, violence against women no, or uh, any activities that would uh, advocate for the uh, ending of the violence against women and their children. Thank you so much. Do you have, do you want to talk a little bit about the getting high levels of participation, participation in rural areas? I mean, you showed us a little bit about the results and they looked very comprehensive, but can you comment at all about the challenges of getting women in very remote areas of the country to participate? Or Valentina, do you want to come in on that? I know you also mentioned geography yes, as an important criteria. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I can add something. Um, now in Moldova, taking into consideration the high level of aging factor, we focus a lot of attention to elderly women. It's very important. Now at local level, specifically in rural area, in many community, Older person, they organize senior clubs, senior groups, and they are very active at community level. And they contribute and they influence a lot political, social, economical decisions. But really, as mentioned my colleagues in other country, it's very important to invest in this form of activity, to support these people. And um, in Moldova, Minister of Labor and Social Protection offer mini grants for different community project in order to empower it, to develop local initiatives of elderly people. Thank you. Thank you. I got word that our colleague Patricia had to step out because she was called by her minister, but that she'll be back as soon as she can and we'll take questions then. Let me use the time then to um, pose a question to Lucy and to Pontus that came from one of our colleagues in, um, from FAO. Um, it's in the chat. It says, um, 
as the EU uh, and Rome-based agency joint program on gender transformative approaches, we seek to support FAO and its partners in adopting gender transformative approaches in their work. What do you think are key entry points for applying a gender transformative lens to social protection interventions? So Lucy, let me give you first, um, first uh, crack at that question, if you don't mind. It's an, it's an absolutely excellent question and I've been thinking about it. Um, what we seem to find from the evidence is that there are opportunities to, to deliver social protection in effective ways. And I saw that you'd um, mentioned the development of fresh produce markets. And I think that's a really superb kind of way of thinking about this. But then to also think about, is there something which can be added into that at a low cost and with a very minimum minimal additional resource um, cost in, in both in terms of human resources and financial resources, which, which turns that from a, a social protection program into a gender sensitive one. And many of these things have already come up in the in these discussions. But I think, you know, Lauren, you mentioned childcare and how much that can and, and how, how crucial that is now increasingly in some of the thinking also in a recent World Bank report showing that good evidence that inclusion of childcare sub substantially maximizes women's capacity to engage in the workforce. And so we see these these. Um, we see that social protection can be this incredible opportunity for women, but sometimes that it needs to have something added to it in order to allow women to take advantage of that opportunity. And then those things that you add, and, and I'm not suggesting that, the, that you um, completely change the program, but by adding some key things, um, for example, a, um, a digital-based parenting support program with gender norms incorporated that's been tested and shown very effective by Godfrey Sue and team in Uganda can just suddenly turn that protection program into something which can elevate rural women's lives so to me that social protection is the entry point and the question is what do you add into it in the smartest and most effective ways great thanks so much that's really really interesting Pontus do you want to add anything Sure. Yeah. No. Thank you, Lucia. Very, very good points. And I, maybe I can just jump straight onto that. So you, you mentioned childcare. I think an area of social protection it's so that's so relevant for rural transformation and transforming agri food systems. It's also the, the in general the looking more at the care economy, and um, this can be a, It's I think it's a very underused entry point that we should be looking at. And this is specifically on, on, on child care, Lucy mentioned that it's an enabler for, for parents, but particularly mothers. But um, more than that, it can, we also see you know, impact on child development. We, and uh, there can also be a link to, um, to actual rural employment through child, uh, child care. Just to mention one very interesting example in, in uh, Rwanda, there is a very interesting gender component in the public works there which is about um, you know, providing childcare to rural women um, who, are, who, are, who are involved in work. So uh, there's a lot we can look at. And if I can be even a little bit more specific on the entry point here, I know there are several interesting regional initiatives that are, that are starting to, to be developed. Just last month, there was a FEO together with UN Women and UNFPA launched an interesting initiative in, in Latin America and, and the Caribbean. And here, one of the focus is to uh, to indeed increase promote rural coverage of care services, and these are initiatives that I think we can and, and should try to um, to link into. Thank you, thank you so much for those additional insights. And I think um, the the finding about care is really central to understanding why the quality of women's work in agri food systems and other parts of the rural economy is often part time or poorly paid or in a vulnerable and stable. Um, so I think that this has a lot to do with why women can't participate as fully in um, in the labor markets in agri food systems, whether that means farming jobs or off farm jobs uh, in rural economies. And so those those are really really important points. Um, 
Well, we have some time still. We, we have this question uh, from um, that I think Lucy was also hinting at about um, uh, markets. And I think that while it's not the focus of today's session, we're thinking more about social protection. I do think that integrated policies, as we've been discussing, which try to address um, both, you know, the, the problems that um, small producers, vulnerable people, women and young people have in accessing um, productive resources, as well as the sort of um, anticipatory action and protection from social pr protection during times of crises, those things need to be integrated. And I think that some of our, our colleagues have already spoken to that. So let me do the following. Let me see if anyone who hasn't written a question in the chat has a question that they would like to pose live um, by um, flagging us or by writing something in the Q&A. Otherwise, I can turn it back over to the panelists to see if they have anything else they want to add about the previous questions. Um, let's give it a second, see if people have any additional questions. If not, let me see if by chance, uh, Elgin, first, if you'd like to add anything while we wait for Patricia to come back online, is there anything else you'd like to add about your experience or on the other questions? I know it's late in the Philippines, so we apologize for that. Okay, um, Valentina, how about you from your side? Is there anything else you would like to add? No, no. I, first of all, thank you very much again for uh, this opportunity to have uh, this space to discuss. I think uh, uh, every country have uh, uh, best practices and can present it. Uh, from my point of view, it's very important to ensure very strong dialogue between uh, governance, between civil society, between uh, different marginalized groups, between academia, in order to uh, ensure uh, strong monitoring and evaluation of all the uh, international and national commitments. All our governance promises a lot. They have a lot of commitments very important commitments for population. And our responsibility is to contribute to implementation, but also to monitor and evaluate concrete measures. As I mentioned, all countries have a good legal framework. We have a lot of programs on social protection too. But what is mechanism of implementation? What are the, uh, not only quantitative, but qualitative indicators? Now it's not sufficient to discuss about how many women were involved in the programs. Now it's important to discuss how the life changes after the participation in these programs. We should, how we can measure quality of life, quality of the transformation, and we should understand gender transformative approach. It's focused on women, but also on men. We should develop and promote partnership, gender partnership, to offer more opportunity to our women and girls. Powerful women, powerful girls, it's powerful society. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And I think that's important to clarify what we mean by gender transformative. And we're talking about changing the norms and the discrimination that exists, right, through discussions with both women and men about, you know, why certain roles are, are assigned to each gender. Um, and I think my colleagues can also share some of the work that we that I mentioned in my introductory statements about gender transformative approaches and, and social protection, just so everybody can see that. So that's very helpful. Elgin, I see you're there. Let me pass the floor to you for your, your final thoughts and comments and questions. Yeah, I think uh, in the Philippines for me, you know, it is evident that social protection measures need to be comprehensive and gender sensitive. Uh, start within the family because it will be start with the shared responsibilities and it will create a small way of having change, behavioral change. And I think it's a form part of transformative uh, social uh, gender measures. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. I think um, that you've provided us such strong examples of the kind of integrated approach that you're taking um, and some of the positive impacts of, of the program in the Philippines. 
Um, Lucy, can I pass back to you if you have anything you'd like to add uh, after all of these interventions and interesting questions? I think this has been fantastic, and um, and I um, I think that what we'll take away from this is both the value of gender transformative social protection and how it is truly achievable. And so I have three things to end with. The first is that the evidence shows that cash plus care works and it can be transformative. The second is that we now need to get that to every woman in the world who needs it and to her families. And the last is that we are going to have to think about social protection that is gender transformative and anticipatory. And I really look forward to that next step of thinking with you all. Thank you so much for the very clear three points, which I think are very strong and well noted. Um, Pontus, I think you might have the last word unless we get any more questions at the last minute. Go ahead, please. Oh, well, pressure. <laughs> no, let, let me just say uh, thank you so much for a very interesting um, uh, discussion. I've been taking so many notes that I'll bring with me to, to RAF, the Regional Office for Africa, where I work, and maybe just to end that, you know, we, we, we need to work better with the gender transformative approaches if we're going to succeed with making um, agri-food systems more inclusive and have an, uh, a more tangible impact on, on uh, food security and, and nutrition. So it's... Um, I'm uh, looking forward to hopefully uh, we keep working together on, on different projects. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So uh, Dominique, unless you have anything to add, I probably will let us all go a little bit early, mostly in respect, I think, to our colleagues in uh, in the Philippines uh, who are um, who are here late in the evening. And we really appreciate that. I want to thank you all for being here, for listening, uh, especially to our three fantastic um, speakers and our two panelists a really engaging set of examples from three very different contexts. Um, and also thank you for your strong focus on evidence, um, on what's working, uh, what the challenges are, also your, your sort of critical assessments about what's missing and what could be done better. I think that's very helpful. Um, Lucy, thank you so much for the evidence that you shared and Pontus for the insights that you've shared from your work in the region. Um, and to all of you, I want to just continue to invite you to participate in these uh, social protection dialogue series, which um, tackles a variety of different topics and which we are really happy to continue to pursue in collaboration with our colleagues in Geneva. So thank you for listening in. Please feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions and have a great day or have a great evening, depending on where you're based. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you and all the best. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you.